So Days Gone didn't exactly have the jumpstart crazy awesomeness that Sony were hoping for, or SIE Bend for that fact. Things have changed a little bit, the game is getting a bit more well received as it ages, which is a little bit strange to see. A lot of journalists seem to be changing their opinions on it. But the thing is, when this game first came out and what felt so damaging to it, was the fact that people who didn't even play the game or were refusing to play the game were leaving comments and just trashing it all up. There was one comment I saw that said that this is just a middling game and buying it will not teach the developers anything. That's an actual quote. People aren't or weren't playing this game. But the thing is, is Days Gone any good? Let's find out. The studio behind Days Gone are SIE Bend, a subsidiary of Sony. Now, if the name isn't too familiar to you, it wasn't really to me either, even though it turns out I had played some of their games. So apart from Days Gone back in the day, they made a really well-received game on the PlayStation 1 called... Bubsy. 3D. What could possibly go wrong? All jokes aside, they are more well known for their Siphon Filter series on the original PlayStation, and in 2011 they did a fantastic version of Uncharted for the PS Vita. Now, if you haven't played a PS Vita, I'm always going to say pick one up. Just had to check it wasn't upside down. The thing is, since we saw Uncharted in 2011 and a little card game they did as well in 2012, we haven't seen anything from SIE Bend. Well, we saw the 2016 E3 trailer for Days Gone, but the thing is, is the wait from 2012 to 2019, a seven year gap, gonna be good for a developer? Can their first AAA game in two generations be any good? Let's take an actual look at the game, dive right in. No, 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 I meant roll the intro. All right, now that all the company history is out of the way, let's dive right in. So Days Gone follows the story of bikey gang member Deacon St. John, two years after the viral outbreak, who is still pining after his wife, who he lost to this plague of the undead. Riding from outpost to outpost that survivors in this world have created as sort of trading hubs and safe spaces, He's been doing missions and helping them out while also living with his best friend, bikey brother, Boozer in an old Firewatch tower. The story follows Deacon as he's still coming to grips with the loss of his wife, the introduction of a dangerous gang called the Rippers who worship the undead, trying to help Boozer who, no spoilers, got into some trouble right at the start of the game, and initially also trying to get your bike back so you can travel north, away from Oregon, and away from all the bullcrap that just seems to come from people when they try to survive an apocalypse. So the story revolves around you finding information on exactly what happened to your wife, and trying to make the world just a little bit safer. The story with your wife starts fairly simply, and gives the game a nice way to make Deacon more wary of spending time with or getting close to others. In the opening cutscene, yeah, there will be a few little spoilers here, but nothing for Endgame, I promise. So in the opening cutscene, your wife has been badly wounded and sepsis is setting in amid the chaos of the initial zombie attack. Well, zombies freak is... I'm going to interchange that a lot. You find a rescue helicopter and get her on board, but sacrifice your spot to stick with and help save your friend on the ground. We know that she's dead and the Deacon wishes he'd been by her side. The way this story bit ties into the rest of the game is actually really good and you get some good plot lines going, but uh... No major spoilers there. There are quite a few side plots going on around this game, some involving characters from the other camps, the life of a teenage girl as she tries to fit into living in a camp after surviving in the wilderness for two years, and tracking down the mysterious Nero, a government group who flies around in big black helicopters wearing hazmat suits and just generally appearing dodgy. These may not seem like too much meat to grab onto in a game like this, but let me tell you that some of the missions in this game are pretty fantastic and definitely get the adrenaline pumping. So we know a bit about the plot, let's take a look at the mission structure, which can really be the downfall in an open world game. There is of course standard open world fare here of random encounters, outposts to take over and destroy, but the way they're done actually tie fairly well into the story and don't feel too out of place. The main encounters you have in the wilderness are 
the Outlaw, Mercenary, or Ripper camps. These ones are a lot like the outposts in games like Far Cry, and you just really need to kill everyone in the camp. After you've done this though, you're given firstly a point to fast travel to, because goddamn can riding your bike get annoying sometimes, especially earlier before the upgrades. But also then you have the task to find their bunker. Now these are just little underground bases with a bed you can sleep at to pass the time, change day to night, you know, that regular thing. But they also contain a schematic for type of weapon or throwable offensive item. It's pretty cool. So we also have the random encounters. Now I don't know for sure if these are 100% random. But sometimes you'll see snipers laser sight on you and have barely a few seconds to react before your bike is shot. Making you take cover and killing the enemy sniper. Or Deacon will exclaim and before you know it a wire trap was set clotheslining you off your bike. This is really fun but there are times where you're just trying to freaking get somewhere, don't have the scrap to repair your bike and BAM! Annoyance. So also you have the Nero bases. As I said above about the shady government group, Nero had a bunch of refugee camps set up which are now all overrun and destroyed. Going here and activating the power will give you the ability to upgrade your health, stamina or focus. You get to choose one of three each time. Just remember to disable all the speakers before turning on the power because shit can go wrong quick. So another one you have is clearing out nests. So freakers build nests. Weird, right? The gross thing is that every time Deacon gets close to one he'll breathe deep and speak as if he's blocking his nose. Yep, can smell it. Definitely a nest around here. They build the nest with sticks and their own shit. Literally. I can't even imagine how gross that would smell. So anyway, level up from nests, you've got hordes. So at the start of the game, they're pretty scary to come across. There was a time I was taking over Nero base, which are all abandoned but may have a few freakers hanging around. I was just about to clear it up, but as I said before, forgot to remove a speaker. I hear an almighty scream as the horde just pours in towards my location. That genuinely scared the hell out of me. So aside from doing these little side activities and the main camp missions, which up your standing with said camps, and you'll sometimes come across survivors in the world that you can choose to send to one of these camps. It will be a very simple affair of clearing freakers out from around a car and then talking to the survivor. This gives you the option of sending them to one of the few camps. This can give you either more standing, allowing you to unlock upgrades, or more money, allowing you to purchase those upgrades. The point here is that you have a choice, full on knowing what the camps are like. One is fairly chill, whereas one, that with enough standing gives you weapon upgrades, is more of a slave camp. People are forced to work very, very hard in order to receive food, and they are not allowed to leave. What seemed like choice and a smart way to make you choose a path like guns or your bike upgrades was lost part way through with these decisions coming few and far between. It would have really made you take a side if you didn't end up getting jobs to earn loyalty for every single camp. This gives choice and brings in your own moral compass, but sometimes there isn't a choice. There's one set mission in the game that has you going to rescue a teenage girl who has been spotted in a small town. You find her, rescue her, somehow she's been surviving for two years among the zombies while waiting for her parents to return to the house. This mission does not give you the choice, and you do find out why later, but you deliver this young girl to a camp and she's instantly put to work, even though it's super obvious that she's still just coming to terms with the fact her parents are most likely dead. This made me feel shitty. And given the choice, I would have sent her to the other camp. As follow-up missions, you speak to her, she's feeling trapped and hopeless, and the missions really just boil down to trying to cheer her up. I've seen this as one of the major issues people are having with the game, where you give up on one of Deacon's personal morals, and potentially one of your own, but trust me, thankfully he fixes all of that later on. The gunplay in Days Gone actually feels really nice, and each weapon has this kind of its own weight to it. You have the choice of carrying one secondary, like a short shotgun, a submachine gun or a pistol, your primary, the assault rifle, full size shotgun, and your special weapon, the crossbows or light machine guns, as well as your melee weapons. 
each take up a slot in their said category and I found the melee weapons to be especially fun and useful, provided you do spend points unlocking the skills relating to the melee weapons. Throughout the game you'll find schematics that alongside finding the right base weapon, the correct amount of scrap, and other items such as saw blades or nails can create some very barbaric but intensely useful weapons. As I mentioned just then, there is a skill tree in this game, and deciding where to spend your points can be a little bit time consuming at the start of the game, but by the end of the game you've leveled up enough in order to basically unlock everything. The skills range from giving you more stamina in certain situations, dealing more damage with specific weapons, or increasing the time you can spend in the focus slow-mo feature you get when you press the right stick down. I spent most of my skill points early focusing on the melee attacks, trying to upgrade how often I could achieve a critical hit, or how much durability the weapons had because damn those weapons can break fast. There is a nifty little skill I suggest that allows you to repair weapons on the fly, otherwise you're going to be running out of them super quick and trying to scavenge one in the middle of a fight. So I'm being pretty cheery about this game. Surely there's some things that annoyed the hell out of me, right? <laughs> yeah, let's get to it. Your bike needs a lot of maintenance. If it's not you trying to find scrap to repair your engine, it's finding fuel for your bike. The early on sections of the game involve a lot of riding and you, you don't really have enough influence with camps, nor camp currency to upgrade your fuel tank. So many times I was walking my bike slowly towards an area just hoping there was fuel. They could have easily just changed this a little bit so it wasn't as annoying, but I guess they were going for some survival aspects that weren't just food. The way jobs unlock are really damn weird too, almost to the point of frustration. You'll be working for an outpost or camp and complete a mission for them. Okay, cool. I have another mission at another camp. You'll be halfway to the other camp when you get a call to come back, as they have another mission for you. It's just really strange and feels like a way to pad out the game a bit more by not offering you the mission straight away, even though I'm sure you've ticked all the little requirements in the game's back end to do so. Now this point is a little my fault, I haven't spent the money to upgrade to a PS4 Pro yet and given the market and the new consoles coming I probably won't. But while the game still looks phenomenal on the base PS4 you do get some serious stuttering and the cause isn't really that obvious. To me I thought this would occur when lots of enemies were on the screen, but in any run-ins with hordes the game kept a smooth consistent frame rate. It was just when you were riding in certain areas it dropped to the single digits, sometimes even freezing for a few seconds. It's just a technical hitch. They've tried a lot with this game and are at the end of the console generation. On the base console I did expect this, but honestly it hasn't tainted my view of the game. There is one major technical hitch that happens in the game though, and it didn't bother me so much until I finally noticed it. Now this has been potentially patched, but if you're going to play this keep it in mind. There seems to be a major issue with texture streaming. Now this happens a few hours after play, so much so that I was actually restarting the game every 1-2 to two hours, otherwise the textures would not load their level of detail properly, leaving you with an entirely smudgy looking game if you started looking at things like walls or items in the world. Just take a look here at the before, and here's after I reload. It's super noticeable. Oh yeah, another really annoying bit. So I wish Deacon would stop yelling! Or talking so much for that matter. I like the character, but he always has something to say and by the end I was groaning when going for a bike ride and hearing the radio come on. Because you knew he'd either yell, have a long winded opinion, or even worse, both at the same damn time. So one cool mechanic I didn't mention earlier, but we'll cut into the audio with now, is the fast travel system. In most games you unlock an outpost and bam, you can fast travel to it. In this game it is mostly the same, except when fast travelling you'll still use petrol, and maybe even more as it won't take the little shortcuts that you can find in the environment. But the coolest thing by far, is if you don't clean out the freaker nests I mentioned earlier, it makes it impossible to fast travel as it's too dangerous. This made me realise that they've done a lot of thinking for this game, and actually tied the mechanics and the world into it, so they were really bland, but something as regular as fast travel they've tied perfectly into their core game system. Big props guys. Alright, should probably start wrapping this up now. I'm gonna say it. 
I had an absolute blast with this game. Maybe not straight from the get-go, but after an hour or two I was really getting the hang of the bike movement, really starting to find something to grab onto with the story, the mission structure, and so, so, so many times I was just stopping to check out the views of a vista, or spend time not even doing missions and just hunting down hordes instead. When you reach the later stages of the game and finally have the tools to take down a massive horde all by yourself, you feel that your own personal skill progression is ramped up in such a satisfying way. After some horde fights, I had to actually pause the game and walk away for a few minutes because I got super intense and my heart was pounding at the end of it. Yes, there are ways to cheese these fights by kiting some enemies, but the real fun lies in wandering in there with whatever confidence you can muster, maybe a little preparation, and laying waste to tons of freakers. Alright, so all in all, I really enjoyed this game. It does have its flaws, both graphically, technologically, and gameplay-wise, but it was a real treat to play, and it seems like a really good jumping off point for what could be a two or three game franchise. Hopefully no more, I don't want them to run this crap into the ground. But that's the thing, I personally enjoyed it, you may not. Hopefully you can make up your own mind about these things and actually play the game before giving it very negative comments, like I've mentioned before. So either wait for a sale, buy it now, do whatever you want. You may like it, places you buy it from probably got a guarantee where you can return it with the seven days if you don't like it. But there was enough content and enjoyment that I've held on to the game and I am still going back and completing side missions. All right, that's about enough for me. Thank you very much for watching. Leave me a comment, tweet me, whatever the social media stuff is, it's all down the bottom there and probably on screen here at some point. Catch you later.